We knew going in property taxes were going to be a hot topic of this legislative session. But then there's the opposite end of that spectrum freezing as in freezing property taxes. House Bill 409 has garnered a lot of attention this week and the bill sponsor Representative Mike Moyle says putting a freeze on property tax increases across the state is needed to at least start a conversation. And that conversation is needed, Moyle says, because Idahoans are being forced out of their homes with the cost to keep them continuing to go up. So fewer taxes sounds great, right? Well, not everybody sold on it. City and county leaders across Idaho say if there is a property tax freeze, they won't be able to keep up with expenses. Nampa Mayor Debbie Kling told us that very thing this earlier this week. Representative Moyle says he hears that, but it's not enough to change his mind. Joe Paris sat down with Representative Moyle to talk about his bill and the criticism of it. I've seen a lot of comments trying to characterize what you're trying to do. People say, well, he's trying to do this. He's trying to do this. I'll ask you, what are you trying to accomplish? I am trying to accomplish a slowdown in the growth of property taxes, and I am trying to force these taxing districts to come to the table and find a solution. Cities and counties are saying that this is the state you know, not having any skin in the game and they're being punished. <laughs> What's your reaction to that? Uh, the problem that cities and counties have is one, they forget that the state sends back literally hundreds of millions of dollars, over $600 million a year we send back to local governments to subsidize them basically for the stuff we ask them to do. The local governments though forget to tell you that the property tax portion of the budget is very small. And uh, you know, instead of having double digit increases in some places, it's going to slow them down. For those city representatives, Mayor of Nampa, Debbie Kling, very uh, open about. She's pretty know. fired up. I like her. Well, okay, so how do you respond to her comments? You know, the best way to respond to her comments was one of her constituents. His name was Ed, can't remember his last name, in committee, where he just pulls out the proposed budget. And you're talking about a budget going up at about 11% instead of 12.4% by doing what we're doing with this property tax freeze. Remember, property taxes in Nampa are about 23% of their budget. If you're telling me she can't handle the freeze on a small portion of her budget for one year while we try to find a solution to these outrageous property taxes, I'm telling you maybe Nampa needs a new mayor. I know I'm seeing and hearing a lot of things about your bill that did not come from you. Are you seeing stuff that oh, you want to address? Oh heck, man, it's politics, man. Everybody makes up what they want. You know, the thing in politics I've learned is you can tell a lie and the longer you tell it becomes the truth. And you're seeing that now. The fact is the bill freezes the property tax portion of a taxing district's budget for one year. There will be a follow-up interim committee request. And if they don't want and can't live with the property tax freeze for one year, then let's sit down and talk in the next few days and find a solution they can live with that slows down the growth in property taxes and keeps those families in Idaho in their homes. And remember, it's a two Idaho situation. Rural Idaho in a lot of places doesn't have a problem. Urban Idaho, Ada, Canyon, Kootenai, Bonneville, Bannock, Twin Falls, they are out of control. And so there's a balance and we cannot find a solution. People aren't willing to talk. Nobody's been willing to talk. Now that the bill's passed, hopefully they're willing to talk. The property tax freeze bill known as House Bill 409. It's now headed to the full House floor. Representative Moyle told me this morning that he expects it to come up on the floor for discussion over the next few days. He adds that he's very open to other ideas. So Brian, he says that he really just wants to talk through these issues and find a solution. For now, though, he says this is the one he's pushing because no one's really wanted to talk about it. It's a pretty harsh words for Mayor Kling there. Yes, but is there an option then for OK? So say this passes, it goes through signed by the governor. It's a law and they put a freeze on property taxes. Is there an option for cities like Nampa that still need that money. There's an option. It's a tough one, though. It's written into the bill that long story short, if you can get two thirds of your voters to agree to impose a new tax, then they're not going to prevent them from raising the taxes. If two thirds of the right. voters were to say, yes, let's do this, it would have to be on one of those May or November ballots. For now, though, it's wait and see. We'll see uh, where this bill goes on the House floor over the next few days. All right, it is going to be a hot topic for sure and continue to be so. All right, oh, yeah. thanks, Joe. What kind of laws have to be broken to get the feds involved in buying a piece of property? Well, that may not be clear just yet. What is clear is that a grand jury is involved and that usually lends itself to a felony investigation. So in short, some pretty serious laws have to be broken to get the feds involved. Our partners at the Idaho Press report the FBI is now investigating the city of Eagle over its purchase of the Landing Community Center a buy the city made last year for $1.15 million. They went into debt to do so, to buy this piece of land, $765,000 for four years. And because a grand jury is involved and it's still open an investigation, 
Not a lot is being said, but the Idaho Press found out the city was subpoenaed by the U.S. District Court of Idaho in December for documents relating to the purchase of the landing. The community center opened to the public that very same month, and in January, some city officials did appear before the grand jury. Then the city got another, a second subpoena earlier this month, asking for any transactions between the city and a Garden City Lighting Company, and they wanted those or that information that went back five years to 2015. Former Eagle Mayor Stan Ridgway, who lost his reelection bid in November, led the effort to buy the landing. Ridgway told the Idaho Press he did not know about either subpoena and he declined, declined to comment any further. Current Mayor Jason Pierce says his office is complying with those subpoenas, but they're also trying to figure out what to do with the place now. Last month, they had to close the landing temporarily because it was missing a number of safety requirements. They got those fixed. Also got a 30 day permit to reopen. However, during that process, Mayor Pierce learned the building is in a zoned residential area, which is not for a government building. All this being said, there have been no charges filed because of this investigation as of yet. But you may remember a year ago when we told you about the law firm that represented Eagle for more than 30 years, they withdrew as the city's counsel. In a letter, the firm said continuing to represent the city could break the professional conduct rules or other laws. And it is unclear if their withdrawal is connected to the purchase of the landing. Paula Jordan may have a clearer path to squaring off against Senator Jim Risch for his congressional seat. Democrat Nancy Harris, who announced her candidacy for that seat last spring, has dropped out of the race as of today. She told me she made her decision based on health concerns. Her doctor telling her the stress of a campaign would not be good right now. And she felt being absent for six to eight weeks would not help her get the Democratic nomination. She also told me she's not endorsing any other candidate. Up to this point, Harris had raised more than $21,000, according to the latest numbers from the Federal Election Commission. There are five other candidates listed as possible contenders against Senator Risch. The biggest name would be Jordan, the former state representative and candidate for Idaho's governor. The other two Democrats still competing against Jordan, Jim Vandermoss and Travis Older. Neither have reported raising any campaign money. Also without cash is Ray Ritz of the Constitution Party and Natalie Fleming, who is an independent. Then, of course, there's Republican Senator Jim Risch, well stocked with a bankroll of more than $1.6 million. Firefighters filling up a stairwell can sometimes cause some worry, but these guys are in training to tackle the world's biggest competition of its kind. Question. Where does the Boise River Greenbelt actually start and end? Do you have a question? Maybe a complaint or just want to say hi? Text us. That number is 208-321-5614. We'll share some of your texts coming up at the end of the show.
For nearly three decades, firefighters have taken on Seattle's Columbia Center Tower, one step at a time. Well, actually, it's two steps at a time. It's called the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Firefighter Stair Climb, and over the 28 years they've been, they've been doing it, they've raised more than $20 million for research to fight blood cancer. And for most of those years, firefighters from Idaho have helped raise that money. So how do you get ready for climbing 69 flights of stairs? Well, you head over to one of Idaho's tallest buildings and get to stepping. It's the second tallest commercial building in Boise. So how would most people get to the top floor of the U.S. Bank building? Most people are taking the elevator. And again, most people aren't Treasure Valley firefighters. Over the last month or so, you'd be able to find several of them, several days a week, filling up the flights of stairs, getting ready for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Firefighter Stair Climb. It represents 2,200 firefighters, uh, 347 departments in eight countries. It's actually the largest air, on-air climb in the whole world. It takes place in downtown Seattle's Columbia Center, covering 69 stories in less time than it takes most people to get ready for work. So the climb itself is 1,356 steps, 833 vertical feet, uh, which equates to, if you were to lay the stairs out, almost 1.3 miles. Which is why they're here, taking two steps at a time in U.S. Bank's 18-floor stairwell. It's pretty good practice, even if they have to go up, <laughs> then back down four or five times in full gear. Full gear uh, is 70 pounds. Um, it's hot. You know, it's meant to keep the fire out, so it also doesn't let any of the heat out when you're when you're climbing. So that's the worst part. The best part is raising money for cancer research. And once again, Idaho will be well represented in Seattle. With this event, we have CUNA Fire Department climbing for the first time ever. Um, Eagle Fire Department climbs, Middleton, Caldwell, Nampa, Boise, Jerome, Coeur d'Alene, Pocatello. And Meridian. This will be Grant Hamilton's 10th year doing the climb. I'm not one of the fast guys and one of the in crazy in shape guys on, on, the, on the caboose. <laughs> it's his family influence that helped him become a firefighter. It's also why he climbs for LLS. I lost my little sister when I was 12. Um, uh, she was nine years old. It's been part of my life uh, for as long as I can remember. It's uh, important to me, important to my family, my friends. Uh, it's kind of, it's a great connection to keep everybody thinking about the things that have, the past, things we've lost, things that we can do to, to make things better for hopefully another family that doesn't have to go through it. Almost all of them have some connection to the cause they're helping fund. So this bit of effort seems small, but will hopefully lead to big results. That was fast. I take 20 minutes to climb stairs. Um, it's brutal, but my 20 minutes compared to what other individuals are going through, man, if I could take any of that away by doing this or trying to get them some form of comfort, I'd walk through hell to do it. For now, nearly a mile and a half of stairs will have to suffice. The 29th LLS Firefighter Stair Climb will take place next month. That's March 8th in Seattle. And the guys that do it really fast can do it in like 11 minutes. They do this for the donations and the pledges, by the way. Their goal this year to get to $3.3 million. And if you'd like to help them do that, you can on their website. It's LLSWA.org. We'll have a link to that at KTVB.com. <laughs> Great job, firefighters, but just to look outside right now, just to show you the traffic, you wouldn't be moving up steps too quickly on this one. Take a look at the traffic through here. It's very slow this afternoon, pretty much expected as you look at a Thursday afternoon. Now, temperature wise, you know, we hit 53. That was our high today, 53 and Ontario 56, 54 degrees for the high temperature in Caldwell. Uh, same thing for Nampa, 50 degrees in Twin Falls. Most mountain locations only had temperatures in the 30s, but expected there in the mountains, right? Here in the valley, we've got clear conditions for those warmer temperatures. Main thing that I need to show you, we've got a very weak front coming through very early tomorrow morning. I think the only thing we're going to see out of that will be wind. Very little in the way of showers. If we see something, it could be 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Next storm is way out here in the Pacific. And if I change over and just go out here just a little bit wider, which I didn't get a chance to do, there are some showers out there, a larger storm that's hitting Saturday night and Sunday. Got a pretty good amount of snow that could be coming down the mountains, maybe even a foot in some of those higher elevations. Here's a look at the future cast. So for tonight, here's that weak front coming through. It breaks up. 
That's 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Now, during the day, just envision winds northwest about 10 to 15, gusts to 25 miles an hour. That's the change. Highs will be in the mid-40s. Wind chills in the 30s, actually, for most of the day. Then as you get into Saturday, here's Saturday evening. Let's get in a little closer. There's our rain showers that will be moving into the area. So watch for some rain later Saturday night, rain, snow mix. Wind chills for tomorrow, mainly the mid to the upper 30s. So kind of a chilly day. Things are changing. 42 degrees for Twin Falls, 43 degrees for Burley. Highs tomorrow come down. As you notice, most mountain locations have temperatures in the mid 30s. We had those mid 50s today. So here's a drop of probably at least 10 degrees or so for many spots where high temperatures will be only into the 40s. Uh, Boise's high tomorrow at 47 degrees. So just to go back over that again, generally dry overnight. There might be a slight chance very early in the morning, but tomorrow's breezy. Then when you get to Saturday, rain, snow, maybe a little snow could be seen. Change it over to rain into Sunday. There's your temperatures. Scatter snow showers Monday morning. Dry for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Look at those temperatures. Still good. They're in the mid 40s. Days like these, sunshine and temperatures in the 50s, a lot of people getting outside and getting into almost spring mode. Which brings up a viewer question sent into the 208 earlier this week. Chris Corey asked us this question in our 208 Facebook group. Where does the Greenbelt begin and end exactly? Well, first, if you haven't joined our Facebook group, I encourage you to do so. It's kind of fun. Secondly, for those of you new to the area and wondering, well, what is this green belt you speak of? You want to get out and enjoy it? Just head down to the Boise River and right alongside it is a tree lined pathway that runs well, basically parallel to the river. Open year round, even when it's not nice outside. Bikers, walkers, runners use the path to travel to a number of parks and destinations and see wildlife along the way, including deer and heron and bald eagles. But where does it officially start and end? For that answer, we went to the City of Boise's Park and Rex Department for clarification. The Boise River Greenbelt in all stretches about 50 miles. It starts up at Sandy Point, which is at Lucky Peak, and then winds through Ada County, the City of Boise, Garden City, the City of Eagle, and stops right around Eagle Road. The City of Boise has the most pathways. It's about 25 miles in total, and that includes both the north and the south side of the Greenbelt along the river. And then the different cities manage their own pieces. 
Uh, 50 miles, that seems like a long way, but maybe you're thinking it seems longer than that because maybe there are sections of the trail further west of Eagle Road, and you're right, there are, but those are not officially maintained as part of the Greenbelt. For example, the City of Star, they call it a river walk, but someday they hope to join that with Eagle and then back into Boise. And last September, the City of Boise celebrated the Greenbelt's 50th anniversary. It was all part of the drive to clean up around the river when they started it, the river itself, because before that, the riverbank was used as a dumping ground for industrial waste and raw sewage. Thank God it doesn't do that anymore. All right, when we come back. We're going to introduce you to, well, he may not be the oldest inhabitant of Zoo Boise, but he might be the most photogenic. We're going to meet Dean coming up in just a bit. Here's a fun fact. I learned this in the Vardis Fisher book we told you about weeks ago. Zoo Boise began in 1916 with a monkey, a chimpanzee that escaped from a traveling circus. Well, some people caught it, put it in a pen, and Zoo Boise was a thing. It was a small thing, but still a thing. And more than 100 years later, you can find hundreds of exotic animals on display at Zoo Boise, even your run of the mill farm animals like llamas. One in particular has been gracing Boise with his presence for years, and while he's pretty cute to look at, he's actually helping Zoo Boise with his conservation efforts. If you haven't had the pleasure, allow us to introduce you to Dean. He's actually Dean Martin, but I think we just call him Dean. He is 22 years old. In llama years, that puts him probably in, in human years, it would be equal to probably in his 80s, I would say. Well, Dean is always handsome. And just over the years, he's grown more and more popular. I'm pretty sure there have been thousands and thousands of photos taken with Dean the Llama over the years. He's such an engaging animal. He's very personable. He's very friendly. He's very tactile. He likes, he loves a good petting. And because we have our farmyard where you can buy grain and, and 
feed the animals and all of that goes to our conservation projects. Dean has been a big part of that message for conservation and what we do. So in a way, he's been one of the animals that's the face of our conservation projects. He's a really good boy and I think he's a great ambassador for our zoo. He's a really good boy. Well, you heard Gene and Holly mention the conservation efforts underway at Zoo Boise. They're part of a partnership to rebuild the Garangosa National Park. What was once one of the greatest parks in Africa, destroyed by more than 25 years of war in Mozambique, nearly destroyed. Last year, Zoo Boise opened its Gorongosa exhibit, which is expected to generate $2 million towards efforts to protect animals in the Gorongosa National Park. All right, we're we'll right back. We're going to get to some of your texts, questions, or comments, some of those you sent in, something like this. Stay with us. All right, this is the part of the 208 where we get to some of your questions and comments. I like this one sent in on property taxes, the topic we talked about with House Bill 409, looking to put a freeze on property taxes if it passes, meaning that it's not going to be a tax relief, but just put a limit, a freeze on tax property taxes to where you paid last year. You won't add on to it, but get rid of the automatic 3% a city can assess without a vote of the residents. This leads to waste in government. Well, it's not an automatic 3%, by the way. For example, yesterday when we talked to her, earlier this week, when we talked to Nampa Mayor Debbie Kling, they haven't taken their full 3% that they're allowed to by state law. They've taken less, some around 2%, not last year, the year or last year, the year before, and they were not planning on taking all 3% this year. So it just depends on the city. Sometimes they take the full three, sometimes they don't. A lot of times they don't because they don't want to put that burden on the taxpayers. Here's a question for you. Why is there a jog in the Ada County line? Ada County and Canyon County line. There's kind of a little notch there right along McDermott. I was kind of looking at that map. It's a good question. Something you might have to kind of look into. 
What I did notice is that it kind of lined up with a uh, with Highway 16, the McDermott and such. We'll look into that. Why it just kind of has a little notch coming out, out of the left side. How about this one? I was born 72 years ago in Idaho. Tired of people moving here because they didn't like where they were from and now want to try and make it the way it was where they were from. Please leave my home alone and go back to where you came from, Rick. Or Rick B wrote that in. Rick, how do you think people got to Idaho? By moving from somewhere else and bringing with them everything that they liked about where they were from, but also because they wanted to start something new. It's kind of what the American dream is all about, right? Being able to kind of move around freely. But this is the 208. We welcome everybody. And we'll welcome you back again tomorrow. We'll see you then.